Well, wonderful. Welcome to all of you. My name is Jaap de Visser. I'm the director of the uh, Dalla Oman Institute, and I've got the pleasure of um, hosting this afternoon's proceedings. Um, and um, yeah, we, we of course, uh, COVID-19 is um, on the agenda in many, many different ways and has dominated um, our lives and public discourse uh, for exactly one year now. Uh, well, maybe even longer than that, but the lockdown started exactly a year ago. So this webinar is um, is part of a, a DOI webinar series where we, which we entitled the unwanted anniversary. It was one year ago that um, that we went into that initial lockdown, which was supposed to last three weeks. Um, and here we are a year later. Um, so of course, a major impact of, of COVID-19 on every aspect of our personal um, lives and on society in general. And a lot is being said about the impact of COVID-19 on the economy, uh, on tax revenues. Uh, there are fierce uh, wage negotiations happening in the public service, uh, obviously informed by the impact of COVID-19 on, on the economy and on tax revenue. Um, I think many of us in this gathering know that municipalities had to take on additional responsibilities in dealing with the pandemic. Um, at the same time, their revenue uh, has come under pressure um, because of the impact of the restrictions, um, but also because of more people being pushed into poverty and inability to pay for services. So the impact of COVID-19 on, on our big cities has received quite a bit of attention. A number of webinars also hosted by the uh, Dalla Omar Institute and, and reports uh, in the media and in, in the policy uh, research domain uh, focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on city finances. So we asked uh, the question, so, but what about the impact on smaller municipalities? What is the financial impact uh, on districts and local municipalities, and can we uh, can we make sense of of actually what is happening in practice, um, looking at uh, at that impact? Um, again, local government had to take on additional responsibilities. Um, there's extra there were stresses on on municipal operations. Absenteeism, of course, played played a role when it comes to the internal impact. Um, but also additional responsibilities, sanitizing public places, um, housing the, the, the homeless, particularly in the first hard lockdown, um, food parcels uh, were, were financed even in some municipalities, um, uh, dealing with the broader impact of COVID-19 on, on municipal services, a lot of additional um, points of attention and responsibilities for municipalities. At the same time, higher unemployment as a result of COVID-19, reduced ability to pay, arguably. Um, some municipalities even went as far as giving uh, rates holidays or deferred, uh, accepted deferred payments and made special arrangements for, um, for businesses and, and individuals uh, that ended up in, in, in stressful situations because of COVID-19. Uh, possibly also a greater uptake of free basic services, uh, reduced economic activity, uh, less consumption of municipal services perhaps. And I don't know what we can say about the impact on property rates, values uh, and, and the income from property rates that municipalities, that municipalities get. And that all in the face of a fast shrinking national fiscus and the prospect of smaller intergovernmental grants. So, um, at face value, a very bleak picture, but but all of what I'm saying is just intuitive and, and what I sort of think is the case. Uh, and uh, we thought it's good to actually get actual experts who have looked at this issue in much more detail um, and, and actually look at some of the numbers and the impact and get a real sense of, of the impact of COVID-19 on, on district and local municipalities. With the last point I want to make is the impact is I would argue is, is immediate, you know, because municipalities have to raise revenue on a monthly basis to make sure that their operations keep going and that their budget is funded. It is not something um, that has a delayed impact where the impact is only felt uh, six months or 12 months later. The, the impact can be quite immediate, is, is my sense. Um, so we're very uh, interested and keen to hear what, what the experts are, are saying, what they are observing and what their research uh, tells them and tells us about, 
the impact on the ground of COVID-19 on district and local municipalities. And what should municipalities do? What should other spheres of government do? Um, there's been some sort of relief coming from national government, but I think generally the message from local government is that that is far too little um, and will not uh, do much to, to, to really cushion the impact. Uh, what do we make of that argument? What should national government do better, do more of? What should provinces do in supporting and supervising municipalities in dealing with, with, uh, with the impact of, of COVID-19? So I've got two fantastic panelists this afternoon, um, Professor Tanya Ajam, she's a professor in public policy, economics and finance at the Stellenbosch School of Public Leadership. There she is, great to have you Tanya. Um, and our second panelist is Dr. Mkululi Ngube, the program manager of the local government unit at the Financial and Fiscal uh, Commission, which is the constitutional body tasked with advising government on intergovernmental fiscal relations. So a very eminent panel with experienced and knowledgeable experts on intergovernmental finance, local government finance, and broadly the economy. So we very much look forward to hearing from them. Um, both will get by 15 minutes to make an input, uh, followed by an opportunity uh, for all of us to engage with them, ask questions, make comments, and also share our own experiences from practice and, and from our own research. Um, before I'm going to give the floor to um, Mr. Ngube, um, I'm going to just give a bit of house rules. Uh, so to avoid uh, background noise, um, we will keep you all muted. Uh, so unless you have the floor as a speaker, uh, please keep yourself on mute. We are recording this session, so I hope that's okay with you. We want to make the recording available uh, afterwards, together with any slides that um, um, that will be shared or that that uh, the panelists are willing to to share with you, um, feel free to switch off your camera and to save data. I think that's sort of general practice now, but would be really great if our speakers, if they are able to, um, put their, their their videos on when they when they have the floor. Um, we have people to assist us in the background. Uh, Ms. Mandy Cupido is uh, in, uh, in the meeting. She sort of is in the background helping out with any uh, Zoom challenges. So if you have any difficulties, send her a private message in the chat. Uh, her name is Mandy Cupido and I'm sure she can assist with any logistical challenges you have. If you have any comments or questions on the presentations, feel free to drop them in the chat. We want to keep the conversation going in the chat box. Uh, that's the most efficient way to, to engage. Uh, so please make, make use of that. Um, and then um, a quick reminder or request, if you wouldn't mind just filling out the evaluation form, a link uh, has been posted in the chat or will be posted in the chat just to tell us what you thought of, of how we organize these events. Um, and uh, I want to briefly mention the support of the Hans Seidel Foundation. They are the sponsor of, of this webinar series. So we're very grateful to the Hans Seidel Foundation from Bavaria um, that, uh, that they give us uh, support to, uh, to organize these, um, um, uh, these, these sessions. Uh, so with that, let's get into it. Uh, and I'm going to ask Dr. Ngube to, um, to give his input. I um, believe he has some slides that he will share with us, uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. Over to you, Dr. Ngube. Thank you, I suppose I'm audible now. Thank you. And my slides are um, showing now. Yeah, I'm going to lead the discussion now and Tanya is going to come forward. I think to me, this is really a great point to look at the impact of COVID is almost as the chair said, it is slightly over a year. It's a year and some two or three weeks since the first case was 
recorded. So it's an opportune time for us to assess the impact. And more important, the impact on this sector, which has been facing the challenge of the pandemic first hand. So it's important to do so. And let me start by saying that when this pandemic visited the country, we know that the sector was already facing a number of challenges, poor quality services, weak institutional and governance capabilities were some of the challenges the sector was facing. There are some statistics which we will be looking at later. For example, if you look at almost 63% of all the municipalities were in financial distress shortly before the COVID, that's more telling. And significant proportion of them were really dysfunctional, a third, let me say, were dysfunctional. And you look at stability in the sector, we're talking of more than half of senior managers complied with minimum competence levels. That is very telling. So there were a number of underlying challenges as COVID set in. One of them is inefficiencies. There were rampant inefficiencies in the sector. If you look at some analysis has shown that rural municipalities before COVID could provide 60% additional services with the same resources. That is about inefficiency in the sector. A number of bad choices also in the sector. We have a lot of these bad choices in the sector. If you think of one municipality whereby the remuneration budget consumes about 60% of operating expenditures, while least another one is 30%. So you can see there were a number of bad choices which were made in the sector, poor financial management. Profiting from supply chain processes was very endemic. Poor asset management, weak accountability institutions within municipalities and some oversight institutions within the sector. The issue of debt, we know we have seen the ESCOM debt going up and we have seen water ports and the next one will be the SARS issue. Interventions in the sector are very ineffective and instability management at management levels. And now with coalitions, I think you discussed that one in the last seminar. So these were the challenges and worse even for district municipalities, which is the subject of this conversation today, the funding model of district municipalities was very, very, left a lot to be desired. So that's the situation at the point of COVID in March last year. So then COVID really provided an additional layer of challenges. And, but there were many challenges the sector was facing. The impact of COVID, we know that it is differentiated. Metros, the intermediate cities, what we used to call secondary cities, and district municipalities and local municipalities, we find the impact is different. We shall see the differentiated impact as we've seen, but more important for us is that the COVID simply amplified some of these challenges which the sector was already facing. Let me briefly look at district municipal because it's the subject also of this particular as well as local municipalities. In district municipalities in particular, we're really in a precarious situation. If you look at before the pandemic, almost 60% of the 44 district municipalities were in financial distress, which is more than half, and that is concerned. And largely, the funding model for districts is very, very, there's some misalignment there. And issues of districts, have been there for more than 10 years and have remained unresolved for that particular long, especially the funding model. If you think of it, the RIC replacement grant, some people have even blamed it for perpetuating inequalities which existed before, but 
issues in that particular sector have remained unresolved. And also we find that within different provinces, MECs for local government may change what districts can do. And this has made it very difficult to have a consistent and robust funding model for districts. And as a result, when we got into the COVID situation, we see that districts were really in a dire position. And now we can talk of the district development model on top of this particular layer. So that's the challenge of district. Let me go to the impact of the pandemic since I have 15, 15 minutes. I just want to underscore the framework which we used it to analyze the impact which we have used it, especially the financial and fiscal implications of the, you can look at the framework at your own spare time. But what it says, we know the aim of municipalities in the middle there is service delivery. And they have to do that, they have to get some expenditures. They have to spend some money. And to do so, they need to get revenues. In the blue shattered area we see revenues on revenues and national transfers. And that's what COVID really impacts. It impacts on national transfers. We see that national transfers have been growing at a decreasing rate of late. And is we know is fiscal consolidation, but the pressures of COVID, which are now really adding another pressure, another layer of another pressure point for government to tighten its fiscal consultation measures is actually affecting transfers. We shall see some transfers in a slide or two later that really there are in transfers are not increasing as before. And some of the grants which were protected are no longer being protected, for example, the local equitable share grant is no longer as, pro, as protected as before. So if you look at the top, the national transfers are also under tremendous pressure. Below on property, on revenues, you look at property taxes, service charges, they are under immense pressures as we are going to see. And also COVID around that, the framework, there's some governance and regulations. The COVID pandemic actually affected some of the governance and regulations and imposed new regulations, which actually had some impact on the sector. So that framework here really helps to understand the different dimensions of the impact of the pandemic. The next slide, I briefly summarize some of the impact and then try and zero down on what we are going to look at today. We have seen on the governance part, these governance systems were disrupted. Decision making was very, very slow. Sometimes at the beginning it was delayed because council couldn't meet and that affected service delivery. IDPs of many municipalities were thrown off course. We know that public participation was disrupted for during the lockdown. So the governance system entirely was really affected and decisions took long and it affected the service delivery. Infrastructure, repairs and maintenance were deferred. Infrastructure projects were postponed and that really affected a number of municipalities and also the entire economy infrastructure led growth was actually to be the cornerstone of the economy and in terms of even going forward repairs and maintenance is an important issue when it comes to recovery so then social impacts we know that intensified access gaps we saw demand for housing and so forth, sanitation, water and transport, and service delivery was disrupted. Hunger and vulnerability also intensified. But we want to, today to focus on the financial 
implications of this, whereby we will focus on myself and Tanya on the revenue, revenues, expenditures, issues around debt for district and local municipalities. So let me look briefly on the impact of districts. I've painted a picture of the districts, how they were faring before the pandemic. And we have seen that many of them were barely viable and functional. If 60% were not functional or function, not functioning properly, then that's really a difficult story. And we know that districts, in terms of the impact of COVID, districts rely to the tune of about 75% to 85% on transfers. So one could say with that, they are fairly insulated from the impact of COVID because they are guaranteed in terms of revenue, the revenues from the fiscals. But because on revenues account at most for about 25%, so they are only exposed to the tune of about 25%. But we have seen of late, if you look at the diagram before, just as an example, of late that it is now difficult to count on transfers because transfers also are now very much exposed. We see additional COVID pressures to fiscal consolidate, which is affecting district municipalities as well as, if you look at the diagram below there, it shows just over the, the next three years, how the allocations to the sector have been really are projected to go. You look at the three years before and the three coming years, the blue is for the three years before and the three years, the red is for the medium term expenditure framework the next three years. You'll see that local government transfers are set to decline in real terms by 2% over the MTF. And this is largely accounted for mainly by the equitable share, which historically government has tried to protect the equitable share in terms of funding the basic needs, water, sanitation, electricity, and refuse removal. But now we see it also falling in real terms, the amounts going into the real equitable share and also the general fuel levy sharing with metros is actually falling. What this means is that the pressures of COVID, which are also forcing the government to adhere strictly to the fiscal consolidation measures and to tighten these fiscal consolidation measures is actually affecting the transfers or the resources available for sharing in a nutshell they are being affected. So this is going to affect local municipalities, especially those who rely heavily on transfers as well as district municipalities. So if we look at this as well as the funding framework, we see that districts will remain are really vulnerable and more exposed than before where we thought because they are heavily reliant on guaranteed transfers, they are fairly insulated. So if you look at that graph below, it simply tells us that the progressive realization of basic services is going to be affected in the medium to long term. That's something to know. Not. Then looking at the COVID in terms of expenditures and revenues, we see that if you look at that diagram here, the diagram before us there, you'll see that we try to trace the revenues and the expenditures before the pandemic, before March, and after during the pandemic. We know that the period is very, very short, but try to trace that one for almost a year for the data which is available. 
we see that before the pandemic, really revenues were doing fairly well in a number of municipalities. But after the pandemic, we see that expenditures, because of the pressures of, this is expected, the pressures of the pandemic pushed the expenditures, while it's the revenues, as we are going to see, have remained subdued. And there is that particular gap which we see after the COVID pandemic and with the uncertainties which are still lingering around, that gap may actually widen going forward. But we know that the impact is differentiated. If we split that, we find that in terms of own revenues, metros are more affected than others, followed by the intermediate cities, which I believe they are the future engines of growth the intermediate cities is these are municipalities which we need to watch and also try and grow then so as we have noted municipality cannot count on transfers to close this particular gap which was the case before because of the fiscal consolidation measures which have intensified and we have seen that some grants are no longer projected as before. So that's the gap which may widen. Then we look at the revenues municipalities are collecting. This particular slide is interesting. We show the period immediately before the quarter, immediately before this onset of the pandemic and some two quarters after that. That's the information we have. You see that almost all municipalities across the B1s, the inter, these are the intermediate cities, the B2s, there is a decline in the collection rates, which means that their revenue coffers are affected across the board. But we only see some glimpse of hope in the later years whereby the intermediate cities, there's sort of some rebound. We don't know whether that rebound will be sustained, but generally we see a, a decline in the recovery. And that is not surprising with the COVID pandemic and the lockdown that many municipalities lost a lot of revenues. And as the chair has pointed out that there are some measures there to postpone collection of some rates and this is the picture we see here then some of them it will be difficult even to recover soon because of the uncertainties which we are still living in so with this particular picture one could say there is a need for the sector to re-strategize to reverse this particular trends and how does it do so i propose some of the measures at the end including new technologies which must be adopted and which COVID has also shown us that we need to adopt certain way of doing things to serve and to be efficient that's the only way to reverse these trends but which revenue sources were mostly affected Looking at this particular chart, we see that the revenue sources which were affected are really from the water sector. It was mainly the water, whereby I think many municipalities lost a lot of revenues. So it's an elastic form of revenue source, including if you look at for rural municipalities, which are B4s there, we see also sanitation was also affected, but property rates were fairly, were less affected compared to other, other sources of, of revenues as water and sanitation and refuse removal. So property rates were less affected as well as electricity revenues. But what this particular picture tells us that there is a need really to think 
especially after the COVID pandemic of really to diversify revenue streams. And we as the, from the commission, financial and fiscal commission, we have spoken about this, that post COVID, we need to think about strategies of diversifying revenue streams to avoid some of these revenues, not relying on these revenue streams, which uh, really can be affected by disasters. So there's a need to diversify from that. That's the message from that particular slide. Then the other thing which I looked at is the issue of debt because COVID can really affect consumers. They don't pay municipalities their bills. And also municipalities are hamstrung by revenue sources and they are likely to be indebted also. What we look to here is the number of municipalities which are failing to make payment, payment which is greater than 40% of operating expenditure according to section 142 C. So, so we have looked at that, but the bottom line from this particular slide is that we know that municipalities owe a lot ESCOM and water boards. But what is happening here, we see that the number of municipalities which have challenges in paying these two institutions has increased. If you look at the red, it is the quarter immediately before the COVID pandemic set in. And then we took the latest figures we have, just to compare the latest figures we have before COVID and the latest figures which we have from the Section 71 report. We see a jump in the number of municipalities which are failing to pay even if you look at these are sometimes put as two indicators. One is a pro rata, the other one is for considering the full year adjusted budget. So, but the bottom line is that there is an increase in the number of municipalities which are failing to make payment to these particular institution. We know that the debt has been increasing, but if you look at the number of municipalities failing to pay is also increasing. So it means many, many municipalities are really facing some challenges in terms of honoring their debt. Then the other thing which I wanted to mention before I conclude is the issue of repair and maintenance because it's very, very crucial. We know that during the COVID lockdown, it was difficult for municipalities to repair and maintain their infrastructure. That is expected. Is expected is not surprising. But if they don't maintain is even after COVID, don't maintain, then that can be disasters, disastrous in terms of service delivery. So I wanted just to highlight that Repairs and maintenance were deferred, it's understandably, but in terms of recovery, recovery will depend on strong, uh, strong infrastructure base, whereby repairs and repairing infrastructure, rehabilitating infrastructure is very, very important. We see that in this particular slide that even before COVID, repairs and maintenance was very, very bad. And during COVID, it continued to really be bad or even worsen in some cases. So it means even the recovery process will be affected and the government-wide infrastructure-led growth project will be affected. So it's important that as the economy recovers from this, repair infrastructure is repaired or even now infrastructure is repaired you find you know, almost all these categories for the period we looked at before the COVID and after the COVID repairs and maintenance were far below the norm of eight percent of operating expenditure 
So that is a worrying trend considering our infrastructure led growth and that growth also must come from the municipality sector. I just wanted to highlight that particular issue. Then let me conclude, Chair, by making some few pointers here and there which we can discuss. And the first thing with this particular COVID, I think there are some COVID legacies, some opportunities. It's difficult to fathom that one saying that there are some opportunities within the pandemic, but they are there here and there, which we must actually sustain going forward. So the first thing I think there is need with a pandemic, especially when we the tried for municipalities to recover and the economy to recover to prioritize. Resources are getting limited, that's the economics adage. Resources are getting limited. And as resources get scarcer and more limited, there is need to reprioritize and deepen planning and coordination capabilities in municipalities, which are very weak, as we pointed out earlier on. So we cannot do everything with limited resources. It's important to prioritize for municipalities to reprioritize what they can do and even projects which can be done on a sustainable basis and which have greater impact on the on communities. And the next point is on efficiency. It's important that there's a lot which can be done if municipalities are efficient with limited resources, declining on revenues and the fact that they cannot count more on transfers which are also under pressure. There's a need to be efficient. And in terms of being efficient there, I really look at the use of smart technologies is very important in this part. We have learned a lot from this particular, uh, with this particular COVID that really municipalities can be more efficient and adopt new technologies than invest or than reinvent the wheel. There is need to invest in digitalization, use digital technologies in the water sector, or other sectors, and they will be they can serve a lot. So there's a need to emphasize the issue of efficiency there. And revenue enhancement. And as I said, there's need really when own revenues unlikely are which are unlikely to increase very soon. And so are transfers. So it's important for if revenues are subdued like that for municipalities to leverage the competencies of private partners. And this must be incentivized, the getting the private partners on board in municipal projects with the right incentives. For example, if you think of the red tape with, within municipalities, that's a good incentive. It doesn't mean money, but looking at what is happening to regulations, bylaws in municipalities, red tape within municipalities. This must be really looked at so that the private sector can come on board. It's not really difficult things. There's need also to strengthen expenditures and revenue effectiveness. Value for money must be the buzzword and also encouraging cooperation, cooperation of municipalities across the board and reaching this will minimize competition for resources. Then the other issue is to capitalize on opportunities to build local economies. I think it's very, very important that municipalities are focus on building their own economies and COVID provides an opportunity to reset the button, to press the reset button in terms of building on economies, especially localization of supply and chain, supply chains, and using procurement as a vehicle to do that. And also targeting 
small towns which are really in terms of tourism and heritage. So these are very, very important in terms of building the local economies. Then also new supplementary revenues. We have made a number of proposals on new supplementary revenues beyond COVID when these revenues can be afforded. There is a need to explore that, but it's difficult now because there are pressures, but beyond that, beyond COVID, it's necessary for us to look into supplementary revenues. Then the issue of repairs and maintenance, I think it's very important. Then there are some of these COVID, what I call COVID legacies, which we have seen now, which I think we, are, we need to sustain these to save on revenues, to be efficient in decision making, and issues of smart technologies, issues of connectivity. There is a lot which can be done there to improve and to serve the municipal coffers. And I suppose that's my last slide with some issues which we can debate going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ngobe. I think uh, you, it's obviously a bleak picture, but with an encouraging uh, end with some really uh, practical suggestions on how to take the matter forward. I was struck by your, essentially your, your correction to my introductory remarks about the immediate impact of, of, of COVID-19 on local government. You made the distinction between district and local municipalities and said, well, local municipalities may be impacted immediately, but for the district municipalities, they were initially um, shielded from the impact of COVID-19 because of their reliance on intergovernmental transfers, but they are now exposed with the imminent reduction of, of intergovernmental funding. So I think a very interesting point there. Um, I think very interesting insight into the various revenue sources and how they were uh, uh, differently affected by COVID-19. Water sector as the most affected and um, property rates uh, fairly stable. Uh, and so that's a very interesting observation. And of course, the big um, ticking time bomb around the debt to ESCOM and the water boards. The numbers are absolutely staggering. I, have, I can't even comprehend what, what that all really means. Those billions and billions that are owed to, to ESCOM and the water boards. And obviously that, that then in your uh, presentation aggravated by for COVID-19, uh, the pressure on repairs and maintenance. Um, and I think your overall point, uh, which I think is in line with the general message that at least got a lot of press coverage um, from the, uh, the FFC in, in, in Parliament saying that uh, the budget and the way we are running our finances and national budget and is putting pressure on our ability to realize, um, to progressively realize um, the, the, the rights and the bit of rights. Um, because the basic services that municipalities provide are not nice to have. They are, uh, most of them are linked to uh, entitlements and rights in the Bill of Rights, uh, where there's a commitment in our constitution that we will progressively realize those rights over time and we will do better every year that is the commitment and a real question now emerges whether uh, whether we are doing that with these budgets and with these financial pictures uh, and realities and the way national government supports municipalities so very interesting presentation thank you very much already quite interesting comments also coming through in the in the chat box i'm monitoring that and i'll collect some of those and and put them to our, our panelists um, after the next presentation because now we're going to have a bit of a look at um, the Western Cape. Um, Professor Ajam Tanya is, has done research on the impact of COVID-19 on finances and operations in municipalities in the Western Cape. So a bit of a provincial look. Uh, hopefully it will teach us about what's happening in the Western Cape, but also how that reflects on the national picture. Um, so we're very much looking forward to that input. Tanya, over to you to uh, give us your, your, uh, your input. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Yap, and thanks to Dr. Ngupe for that excellent overview of uh, the national picture. Uh, so I just want to pick up on a few issues that um, Kolulu raised, which I think is quite important. The first one is that we've had a decade of inaction on 
forging a local government fiscal framework, clarifying what the role of district municipalities are, um, putting a new own revenue source for uh, revenue um, uh, to replace the RSC replacement grant in district municipalities. Way back in 2008, there was this white paper on local government that has gone nowhere. Right. Um, so when you look at what's happening in municipalities, know that it's ineffective national regulation that is also contributing to this. And um, I want to concur with um, Kululi's point on the fiscal consolidation and the local government equitable share previously being protected. And now we have a situation where government wants to create more entitlements. So you want to create higher education, you want to create a basic income grant, but you're not funding your existing entitlements. And you just have to look at health in the Eastern Cape to see the, the impact on that. Um, so, you know, it, it's fine talking about progressive realization when budgets are increasing, but when budgets are decreasing, where do you politically take the, 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 the cut there? And we can tinker with the structure of the formula all we like, but at the end of the day, it's the vertical division that matters. And that is the expression of true political priority, whether you prioritize municipalities or, 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 or not. So um, I want to just uh, recognize the colleagues from Hans Seidel Foundation here, um, Marlena and Hans. Uh, without their support, it would be difficult to have uh, implemented this research project, uh, which is actually still in process. So I'm just going to share some uh, high level findings. Uh, but what we did is that we looked at seven local municipalities within the Western Cape, uh, two large ones, three medium ones, and two small ones, as well as three district municipalities and the metro, but we won't talk about that because that's not really the option. Um, it's not really the area of, of this uh, that we're focusing on in the seminar. And so to get an idea of what the short-term impacts would be, we looked at the quarterly section 71 reports um, on, from the National Treasury website. So we used the same data essentially as what um, Kaluli did. Um, and uh, our working definition of fiscal sustainability is that we were asking, you know, can the municipality sustain its current spending and revenue policies while delivering on its mandate and meeting its financial obligations without the threat of insolvency or default on its obligations? So uh, we were looking at a definition of sustainability that includes both financial and uh, operational. Um, so our main focus, obviously, because we're looking at quarterly data on the short term impacts. Um, especially in uh, the first quarter of the pandemic, which was April to June 2020. Uh, that was quarter four of the 2019-20 uh, financial year. Uh, then we looked at the second quarter of the pandemic, July to September, the third quarter of the pandemic, um, October to December. Obviously, we are in the successive quarter uh, that will close in March. So we couldn't look at, at that quarter because it's not uh, completed yet. And uh, I think that it's very difficult to make generalizations because municipalities are so uh, different. But I want to point out that municipal vibrancy and economic activity is inextricably linked to the national economy. So, you know, unless you see a, a national revival, uh, you're not going to see uh, a rebound in uh, in the municipal uh, local economies, unless those local economies were already strong before the, the pandemic. And uh, I think the key point uh, that I want to bring across is that there's been remarkable resilience in the short term in many of the Western Cape local and district municipalities. Uh, but that doesn't mean that medium and long term financial uh, sustainability threats uh, are not present. Uh, so what we found, and I think that this accords well with what Mukululi uh, presented to us, is that the pandemic simply amplified whatever prevailed before the pandemic. So where there was governance and financial instability, uh, for example, Canaland, which was under uh, Section 139.5, uh, we see that exacerbated. Um, where there were stable political uh, administrative interfaces with systems were in place before the pandemic, we see 
uh, much more resilient. And uh, the more proactive municipalities actually learned lessons from the drought, which was particularly acute in the Western Cape. And uh, they'd already been thinking about climate change issues on uh, traffic uh, congestion um, that raised working from home and business continuity plans. So um, there were a lot of uh, systems that were thought about in some of the municipalities uh, prior to the pandemic, which then uh, helped their, their resilience. So um, I want to go to um, the interesting case that I mentioned earlier of Kanaland, um, especially since you are a, a lawyer, yeah, so this is your area, right? Um, but uh, the Western Cape uh, Provincial Executive Council and the administrator of Kanaland applied for uh, an interdict against uh, Kanaland entering into a PPP of uh, 745 million rand when the operating budget is only 175 million rand. So essentially they were outsourcing the entire electricity production function and they were signing away the next 25 years of revenue to this private company, which they bypassed the PPP process. And um, they undermined the administrator um, and what they wanted to do was basically um, double the uh, political establishment in the speaker's office. Uh, so they wanted to add an office manager, a driver, a clerk, a political support officer, and a support staff member. Okay, this at a municipality, you know, that's already financially challenged in the extreme and isn't actually doing much work because of the pandemic, right? Um, and I think that it was really interesting to see that High Court Justice, um, Mangu Lockwood, uh, she said, you know, there's no justification for why during a financial crisis, which is common cause and a global pandemic, a member of the municipal council whose office previously had only one assistant should now require five additional employees, right? Um, so for me, this is a very interesting uh, case because it shows that as budget constraints are becoming tighter and tighter, South Africans are doing what they always do, which is resort to the legal system. And while you know the courts have been quite reticent about uh, trying to get involved in intergovernmental finance issues, you know they might face more and more uh, pressure to to actually do so. Right. Um, so now let's just focus on uh, the Western Cape. And uh, I think it's useful to just reflect on some very nice data that the um, provincial treasury of the Western Cape put out in the municipal uh, economic uh, um, review and outlook document. It's called the Mero, right? And what they do in the Mero is that they look at um, past uh, growth trends for the province and for each of the municipalities. And then they look at what is estimated to happen in uh, 2019, 2020, and 2021, in terms of the GDPR, the regional uh, GDP, which is a proxy for economic activity in municipalities. So um, what's interesting for the Western Cape is that, you know, even prior to the pandemic, growth was really sluggish. It was 1.4% um, uh, for, the, for the province. Right, um, and then in 2019, uh, that falls to 0.3%. Uh, okay, so much less than half a percent. Um, remember that the pandemic struck in the fourth quarter, um, you know, towards the um, uh, start of the of the of the uh, end of the fund of the of that financial year. Um, uh, but for this year, the economy is predicted to contract. Uh, by 6.9%. And then uh, it's anticipated to rebound much faster than the rest of the country, 3.4%. Uh, okay, so that's for the Western Cape as a whole. But when you look, you'll see that your bigger municipalities with more diversified revenue bases, uh, like Stellenbosch, uh, they are hardly in impacted and they rebound very quickly, right? So, um, uh, you know, if you look at Stellenbosch, uh, for 2019, there is a 0.1% growth rate, so it's a slowdown in, in, in growth rate, but it's not as bad as Bergrafir, for instance, where there's a 2.3% uh, slowdown. And then Stellenbosch is um, 
anticipated to rebound uh, quite soon thereafter. So um, uh, they are anticipated to rebound to 4.3% in 2021. Um, you know, if you look at a rural municipality like Bergevier, uh, they also rebound, but they only rebound by 1.7%. So you see that the bigger um, secondary cities actually have uh, more resilience than uh, um, your smaller um, and rural municipalities, uh, precisely because they have um, a richer uh, rates and tax base, uh, were more able to work from home, and so there was much less loss of livelihoods, et, et, et cetera. So the size and the diversity of the revenue base matters a lot. Um, also the composition of the local economy. So even when we look at rural municipalities, we see that those who were not in drought, but they um, relied on agriculture actually did much better than expected uh, because we had better than expected citrus, we had better than expected wine exports. Um, so uh, that was basically a saving grace for the local economy, but those municipalities were heavily dependent on tourism and hospitality, they really took a knock. And so you see even the city uh, takes quite a, a big knock there, Winelands as, 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 as well. And so um, I think that besides looking at the fiscal capacity, you also have to look at what municipalities did proactively to try and manage the situation. So how soon did they establish working from home uh, arrangements. How soon did they open their revenue offices? Did they do it early, right? Uh, most municipalities in the Western Cape actually opened their revenue offices uh, very early, right? Uh, before the pandemic, they already had revenue enhancement strategies. Um, so, for example, they were um, updating the email and cell phone address of, of clients uh, so that they could do e billing and they were cleansing the data. Um, and they were also uh, intensified existing cost containment uh, measures that were there uh, before the, the pandemic. So when you actually look at the operating budget, it's quite strange, but you, you just see uh, a hit in the first quarter of the pandemic, and then you see quite a quick rebound, um, except in, this, in the smaller municipalities. But we, uh, in the Western Cape, you see the hardest hit is actually in the capital budget. Um, and this is because many of the Western Cape municipalities don't rely on as much on capital grants that they get, um, like MIG, for instance, but they actually borrow. And so with all of the uncertainty and the high cost of borrowing, uh, that really forced a reliance on internal capital reserves. Um, so luckily they have these internal capital reserves, but it also creates problems because once these reserves are drawn down, you can't really replenish them. Uh, by borrowing, uh, which means that you're going to have to um, uh, uh, cost reflective, uh, price cost reflectively. And interestingly, um, it wasn't water that was the main revenue issue um, in the Western Cape because of the water pricing arrangements, which had already kicked in. Uh, it's actually the electricity surplus that is being depleted uh, because of NERSA uh, bulk tariffs. Uh, so uh, that surplus is, you know, a, a form of cross subsidization, etc. So that being depleted is um, it's it's a hard knock. But interestingly enough, it's a systemic knock. It's not a knock because of the pandemic. And so almost all of the changes that we see is not due to the pandemic per se, um, but more due to these longer term systemic factors, which for me was, uh, um, you know, quite surprising. So, um, you know, when we look at the revenue side in Western Cape municipalities, uh, we see that uh, the rates and user charges were actually not audit, okay? Um, and that's because, uh, as I said before, uh, if you look at the finance sector, which is big in the, in the Western Cape, that was an essential service. It wasn't affected by lockdown, could easily migrate to working from home. So you, you find that rates and user charges took a knock but they didn't uh, uh, take as big a knock. And because they uh, constitute the majority of the revenue, it really wasn't that bad, right? Um, 
when you look at smaller own revenue sources, these were practically decimated. Uh, so if you look at fines, uh, penalties, licenses, uh, rental of municipal properties, etc., those took a lot. But because they were a small percentage of overall, you know, it didn't really uh, make uh, that much difference. So, um, you know, really it is the longer term sustainability practice which uh, are more prevalent than uh, the um, uh, short term practice. And one of the biggest, uh, Dr. Newby has mentioned before, is uh, employment and uh, bulk service cost es escalation. Um, so while you have your local government equitable share and your capital grants uh, being cut due to national um, um, uh, for fiscal consolidation, Salga hasn't been able to contain these uh, uh, two forms of, of, of expenditure, which basically places a lot of uh, uh, pressure on municipalities. Uh, what was also quite interesting was that, uh, yes, there were in Western Cape municipalities increased costs of PPP, sanitizer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there was also, especially in rural municipalities, uh, a massive savings in terms of travel and subsistence costs. Because every time there's a physical meeting in Cape Town, um, you know, somebody has to go the night before, stay in a hotel, meet for five hours, and then drive back, right? Uh, so I hope that that is an innovation that stays even post pandemic, as Mukaluli says. Um, and uh, I think that what's interesting is if you look at the three basic costs, which uh, the cost of free basic services and the revenues uh, forgone by these municipalities and what is projected over the medium term expenditure framework, I feel that they have um, underestimated what the impacts are going to be. Um, so the underestimated, the longer, more medium term uh, loss of income and uh, loss of livelihoods. Right. Um, obviously, it's contingent on what your assumption is, but whether there's going to be a th third wave, etc. Um, but I do think that um, while not problematic now, it could be uh, more problematic in, in the future. And um, I want to point out, um, and you know, in response to what Mukaluli said, uh, there were so many more uh, compliance requirements for reporting, uh, which fell on municipalities. And the irony is that it didn't stop the looting anyway. Uh, so you find that your good municipalities were struggling with trying to deliver services are entangled in this increased reporting requirements, which is for governance purposes, but it's not stopping those people and those municipalities from doing um, you know, um, financial misconduct, etc. And I also think that the transition to INSCOA, um, the uh, municipal uh, standard chart of accounts, uh, also made uh, compiling these reports very difficult. Um, sometimes there are massive anomalies there. Um, so when you look at uh, the local municipalities, I'll come to the districts later, um, what you see is that uh, if you compare the first quarter of the pandemic with what happened a year ago, right, so it's a quarter on quarter comparison, uh, you'll see that um, Stellenbosch actually had a 3% uh, increase. Um, uh, so, so, so if you look at your um, your surplus as a percent of percentage of operating revenue, um, Stellenbosch ran a three percent surplus in that quarter, and then in the second quarter it ran a forty one percent surplus, and in the third quarter a fifty six percent surplus. So, you know, when I look at the operating budgets, um, you know, you can go deeper, but you know, you really see a massive resilience, right? Um, on the other hand, if you look at a smaller municipality, uh, for example, Yesifwa, uh, you see a 54% uh, operating deficit as a percentage of revenue in the first quarter. Um, and then it swings into a 55% um, surplus and then goes back um, in the third quarter of the pandemic uh, to a 19% deficit. Right. Um, so the impact really uh, was order on your um, bigger municipalities uh, on the operating budget side than on the um, smaller municipalities, right? And partially because of the grant insulation effect. But when you look at the capital budgets, you'll see 
that the biggest municipalities and the smallest municipalities were hardest hit, and the medium-sized municipalities actually fared um, much better. So, um, you know, when you look at Stellenbosch, you see that the um, uh, capital expenditure in the first quarter of the pandemic, okay, which was in 2019-20, uh, quarter four, fell by 56% compared to the, the previous year. And then in the next quarter, it was 32% less than the previous year. And um, in the quarter ending December uh, 2020, it was 23% less. So these are actually quite substantial drops in the um, uh, capital budget. Um, if you look at a municipality like Lanesburg, uh, you interestingly enough, you also see in the first quarter a 77% drop off in capex, uh, which is during the hard lockdown. Uh, but then you see positive growth uh, in the subsequent two quarters to the extent that, you know, um, in the third quarter of the pandemic, there's 139% a year on year improvement, right? Uh, so that's actually quite uh, remarkable. If you look at uh, Swatland, you see that uh, they actually didn't have a drop in capex at all. Uh, so the first quarter of the of the uh, pandemic, there's a 38 percent increase in capex. The next from the previous year, uh, the next quarter a 98 percent increase in capex of the previous year, and the next year, uh, next quarter 25 percent increase. So if I look at these numbers. And this municipality is so resilient that I don't actually see in the numbers where the impact uh, really was. So that is the importance of uh, strong systems. So then let me just uh, quickly go to district uh, municipalities before I, I, I conclude. Um, and I want to agree with uh, Mukaluli that uh, district municipalities, they face um, limited scope of revenue on the upside because they don't have their own revenue sources, right? Um, except for, you know, if you look at West Coast in uh, city in the Western Cape, they actually have a bulk water concession. So they have revenue from there. And so they can be uh, a lot more resilient before that. Um, but where they have been very good is actually in controlling the expenditures, uh, which is the only thing that they could control. And this is the difference between the responses that we see in the three Western Cape municipalities uh, as compared to um, the municipalities uh, elsewhere in, in, in the country. So the net effect on your uh, district municipalities is that there's a slight impairment in the short term in liquidity and solvency, but it's still satisfactory by um, national treasury norms and standards. You know, even though you know, you're running down investment income, you're running down internal reserves, you know, which will have to be um, re uh, replenished later on. Uh, what is very interesting in the Western Cape was also, especially in the rural district municipalities, that they did play uh, quite an important social development role. And um, that's what uh, both you and Kaluli referred to, uh, you know, the food parcels, um, uh, assistance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that isn't actually the district municipality's role, you know, if you look at the legal mandate, but they will say, you know, who's going to be doing this? And, and so you actually have um, the um, allocation of powers and function is out of sync with reality. Uh, but, the, but, you know, there is a, a, a reason for why, you know, it is that way, you know, and so, you know, it raises the issue of, you know, after the, you know, after 1994, how functional are those uh, distributions of, of, of powers and functions and how symmetrical should they be? Um, you know, if you have strong districts, obviously they can do more than, you know, when districts are, are, are weaker. Um, and uh, I, I, I also you see constrained capital budgets. So for uh, district municipalities, they almost deferred most of the uh, capital expenditure, except where there was contractual uh, obligations. The other area where district municipalities get revenue from, for example, Cape Winans, is basically agency services that they do for the province. And uh, when you look at uh, roads income, for instance, you'll see that this was hard hit in the first quarter of the pandemic, and then systems were put in place, lockdown eased, and you see this revenue actually uh, coming in. Uh, so there was this initial uh, disruption and then uh, resilience. Um, 
So you just give a round off by just giving uh, some sort of figures to just, you know, so you can assess the magnitudes of that. Um, now, when you look at the surplus as a, or deficit as a percentage of operating revenue in the first quarter of the pandemic, um, that falls to a deficit of 75% of operating revenue for Cape Wine Nets, you know, in the first uh, in the first quarter of the pandemic, which is massive. Um, but then it swings into surplus again, and you see 39% uh, uh, surplus as a percentage of operating revenue and 11% in the last quarter, right? Um, if you look at uh, Central Peru municipality, uh, district municipality, you'll see that they had an 11% operating surplus um, in the quarter of, that the pandemic struck, uh, which was 2019-2020 quarter four. Uh, but then in the subsequent quarters, they swing into surplus. So they swing into a surplus the second quarter of the pandemic of 60% of operating revenue. And the um, uh, following quarter, 51% of operating revenue. Uh, so that's actually uh, quite a remarkable uh, a, a resilience. But as I said before, we, they really felt the pandemic was on the capital budget side. Uh, so, you know, when you look at Cape Winelands, you see a 78% uh, cut in capital budget in the first quarter, and that doesn't really recover much. And in central Peru, 88% um, cut in capital budgets for the first quarter um, of the pandemic compared to the same quarter in the previous year, and then 100% cut in, in the, in the uh, quarter thereafter. So uh, the portion that Nikoluli raised about uh, deferring uh, uh, capital expenditure, deferring maintenance, definitely, you know, pinches at uh, um, your, 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 your district municipalities. And so, you know, I just want to round off by just emphasizing once again, you know, the importance of a stable political administrative interface in determining uh, resilience, uh, the experience of the management teams. So uh, I think Mkululi mentioned that in other parts of the country, there are a lot of act people in acting positions. They don't fulfill the minimum competencies. Uh, in the Western Cape, we have CFOs who are uh, in some cases, or CAs. So obviously, you know, there's a, a higher level of, of, of quality of, of, of management there. Um, so to round off again, I was quite surprised to, to see the degree of resilience in Western Cape municipalities in the short term. Uh, but I would say in the long term, there are a number of uh, challenges that face not only Western Cape municipalities, but they probably better off, but, um, you know, the rest of the uh, sphere, uh, which really need to be addressed as a, as a matter of urgency. Okay, that concludes my, my, my input. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was really quite a remarkable um, input, um, very rich in, in detail and, and uh, very, very interesting. I mean, basically continuing the, the theme of Dr. Kube on the differentiated impact and basically also making the point that the Western Cape seems to have weathered the storm uh, slightly better than the general national picture suggests, but again, uh, very deep underlying sustainability challenges that, 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 uh, that persist. Uh, but the differentiated impact, different between district and local municipalities, different impact between well-governed and not well-governed municipalities as a key theme, I think, rising above your, your presentation, the difference between impact on rural and urban municipalities, and also the different impact on capital and expenditure budgets, quite, quite a differentiated picture there. Um, so fascinating, fascinating input. We have a few minutes left for a bit of an engagement and some questions from uh, the audience. Um, I've already sort of picked up a few that I can maybe put to 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 um, Kuluri so long, uh, Dr. Kube. There was a question from Alison Changana on on why the property rate seems to have been unaffected by uh, COVID nineteen. You have any views on? Why that would why that would be um, when when water is, is heavily affected and also from Tanya's uh, presentation uh, electricity 
uh, but service charges less so. Why is it the case with, with property rates being unaffected? And maybe could you elaborate on the discussion that you that you started on new revenue sources? Um, I know the FFC has done a lot of work on uh, identifying new revenue sources and um, any, any insights you want to share on that. And then there was a question, I think two questions um, from, from uh, I think Calvin Johnson, as well as Joe Mavuso also joining that chorus of, um, what do we make of looking at the long-term uh, a huge debt problem. Um, we are bailing out SOEs um, in with with huge uh, amounts of funds from the national fiscus and guarantees, etc. And the debate is now starting. What about local government? Is local government entitled to similar types of bailouts or debt cancellation? And what would the impact of that be? I already see Tanya looking very. Uh, very grumpy <laughs> from a macroeconomic perspective, but I mean it's a question because we uh, we 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 seem to be quite okay um, bailing out SOEs. Well, not okay, but I mean we know the debates. Um, and and what are we doing with this heavy debt burden that hangs around local government's neck? So those are a few comments that I would like to pose to the panelists. So long, and then I see Professor Reddy's got his hand up. If you want to make your input, uh, PS, please, please go for it. Thank you very much. Uh, sometimes it's just easier asking a question than having to type it out here. Sure. Uh, Tanya, you, you made mention of the fact that, you know, the municipalities have saved quite a bit as a result of Zoom meetings or online meetings and so on. And, and I just want to pursue that angle a bit more. Now, if you're looking at uh, COVID-19, according to the United Nations, it's the worst disaster since Second World War. And if you're looking at the consequences, it has been very devastating. But there has been some positives. For example, digitalization and uh, uh, all these online services and so on. Now, you know, my concern here is we've invested quite a lot in terms of capital, in terms of resources, in terms of technology. And what I would like to see is not us going back to the old. You get what I mean? For example, if you're looking at council meetings, even if you're looking at university lectures, we've started this process and you know nobody has any violent objections. The system seems to be working very well. Now, how can we you know what I mean, uh, promote this culture and encourage this culture so that you know, this is also in preparation for, for the fourth industrial revolution. And we'll also be saving a lot of money. Thanks, any ideas? All right, can we, can we start with those questions? And maybe just ask um, both of our panelists to sort of reflect on whatever question they feel most comfortable with. And then I'll keep looking at the chat in the meantime to see if we've got any more. Uh, Dr. Mpuloi, do you want to start? Thank you, let me start and attempt some of the questions. Let me start with the last one. I think it's an interesting one also in the sense that there are some what I call these legal issues, legal issues we need to sustain digitization and so forth. So my point which I mentioned in my presentation is that there's a need to move on with these particular because they serve a lot, they are efficient. And so my suggestion on that one was that there's a need for the intergovernmental physical relations system also to respond to these changes positively. For example, the grant system must actually change and respond to the issue of digitization so that many municipalities could champion that because that's the way to that's the way to go and we see the benefits of adopting these smart technologies so my suggestion was that the intergovernmental fiscal system must also adapt and change with the times and actually support or incentivize these new technologies across the board in municipalities then the other question was the issue of debt and the bailout issue. 
on that one, I even the bailout to SA and so forth or SOEs really is not the best way. And I don't think bailing SOEs, bailing municipalities will be the way to go. I think it's something we need to limit and discuss and have a conversation about and limit the issue of bailout, bailouts across the board, not to municipalities, not to SOEs, because you do so it becomes a vicious cycle and where do you end? And we have seen it with SOEs now that it's a vicious cycle that it has, it has no end. So there is, to me, my point would be not allowed to anyone at all, because we try to limit. And well, there may be some, uh, some circumstances which allow that, but I think it's something we need to limit. I wouldn't really encourage it in the local government sector. It will be really destroying what we have built so far in the past 25 years. New revenue sources, we have, I know this thing when we raised it, we raised the issue of supplemental revenue shortly before the COVID. Then when our report was released, it was during the COVID. So that particular timing of our report, I think the feedback we got was really negative about supplementary revenue sources because it was like, why are you advocating for new revenue sources during the COVID pandemic when people are really at it or consumers, companies, individual households, individuals and et cetera are really suffering from the COVID pandemic. So it was a timing issue, but we emphasize that one is just we need to have to broaden to diversify our revenue streams. I think this talent push issue to me was a very, very important one that diversity is very diversity, quite revenue source, improves a municipal resilience. Well, then to us, I think we are saying post-COVID issues, I think we need to look at some of these revenue sources. Not all municipalities can levy some of these revenue sources. For example, I've seen some applications of municipalities applying for certain revenue sources now. But we need, especially post-COVID, to explore different revenue sources. And it should be a case by case, not a blanket, because some municipalities cannot, they need to really exploit their current revenue sources to the fullest before moving into alternative or supplementary revenue sources. But there are those, especially intermediate cities and metros, where there is a need to explore new revenue sources. If I tell you that after our report, we submitted our report, one of our recommendations was the issue of development charges. And now that we are, Treasury is processing development charges and it will be a really a viable alternative revenue sources. We have some like land value capture mechanisms of different sorts, which we can really do more research and allow municipalities to exploit beyond the COVID thing. So we need to look at those because relying on the all these revenue sources for some municipalities, it may not work, but it may work for others. So we need to broaden the scope of alternative or supplementary revenue sources. Then why property rates? I was doing the calculations yesterday evening for this particular assignment, then that popped up. I asked myself why property rates are, seem to be not had hit by the COVID pandemic. Is it the delayed effects? Is it going to have some effects? I don't see the, I couldn't come up with a good answer on why property rates are less 
affected. But looking at the property market and the COVID, we see that property market has really been subdued for the period of COVID is picking up, if you look at the figures now, is picking up to a certain extent. Perhaps we need to look closer into what has been happening to the property market, which I didn't have the time to look at. So, but I think we can find some reasons on what was happening to the property markets during, before the COVID and after the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gube. Uh, over to you, Tanya. Are you going to argue in favor of bailouts? Uh, absolutely not. Right? Um, before I get to the bailout questions, I just want to touch on the property rates um, question. Because uh, property rates is heavily seasonal, right? Um, so because the first quarter of the pandemic coincided with the end of a financial year, um, people had to pay the property rates before the end of the financial year, right? Um, and so that was one of the reasons why you don't actually see the impact um, uh, as badly, you know, as if, if you would started, you know, somewhere else in the in the financial year. Um, so it's that point coupled with my previous point about higher income households, um, especially in the in, in the Western Cape. And then on the issue of new revenue sources. I think that it's quite important to also realize that municipalities have to walk a fine tightrope between affordability and sustainability, right? Um, if they jack up their rates and taxes, uh, you know, much above cross reflectiveness, uh, then they're going to result in bad debts, right? Um, so it's a it's a quite a difficult balance that they would need to uh, uh, maintain. Uh, on the SOEs. Um, this is just my personal opinion, uh, but there are SOEs and there are SOEs. Um, with SAA, we don't need a national uh, airplane, uh, airline, etc. And, you know, uh, there's no way that any bailout would not have led to more and more, right? And so if I were sitting as a director making a decision there, I would say this is the point that you actually need to can it, right? Um, on the other SOEs, the issue is really the issue of governance. Because, you know, if you have a working ESCOM, if you have public transport that works, that um, buoys and stimulates local economies. But if you are going to constantly put these political deployees with no knowledge of the sector, you're actually going to throw your money into a deep pit, right? Um, so, uh, you know, you really have to make those hard governance choices. And then uh, coming to Professor Reddy's uh, question, I, I think that it, the question that you're posing is just absolutely crucial, right? We need different ways of doing things. So for instance, if the planning department has shown that they can work from home, uh, they can't we have better shared services uh, between uh, municipalities because part of the reason why shared services didn't work is because you know your engineer or your planner had to drive from office to office, which wasted a lot of time, right? Um, so you know um, maybe uh, you know there's different ways that we could uh, work together, uh, you know, explore different forms of, of cooperation. But here again, I think it comes down to poor regulation. Why is it that you know we pay so much for data, but in Namibia and in other African countries, those same service providers sell the same product for less, right? Um, so really, you know, we need to make data as reasonable as possible and possibly even look at uh, uh, changing a grant structure uh, to make sure that we improve data access, especially in rural municipalities where the private sector is not going to want to step in because your densities are archival. Great, thank you. We have almost run out of time, but I did see um, uh, Mr. Hans Buhler had his hand up. Um, he's the uh, representative from the Hans Seidel Foundation. So I want to quickly give, uh, give the hand of floor to uh, Hans Buhler. Uh, over to you, sir. Hello, yeah, and thank you, Tanya and uh, Dr. Ngube for the brilliant input. Uh, just a quick question and a very short comment. I know we're running out of time, but if I follow now the input by both of you um, and especially the, the, the results of the studies, it is once more underlined, right, that 
in a way stable governance systems and stable administrative systems uh, is just a basic for for functioning uh, local government system so if this is the case and this is i think it's basic stuff right um, everyone in a way knows that um, if this is recognized then this should be maybe also prioritized and uh, my question is do you have the feeling that this is being recognized on all levels of government um, and if so is the district management model then uh, the solution great i think that's a wonderful closeout question maybe i can ask both our panelists for a brief final comment taking into account what uh, what hans just raised uh, dr Ngube, do you want to go first Yeah, it seems to be, this seems to be really simple solutions or findings, stable governance, stable systems are really going to contribute to sustainable municipalities or viable municipalities. That's clear, but from what we have seen so far, it has been really, I think, Tanya alluded to some of the points. We can talk of what really limits having these stable governance systems. We find there are so many things, issues around deployment and so forth. So lack of political will in those particular areas. So it really limits stability in the governance of these institutions. We have seen that stable municipalities need, stable municipalities tend to turn the corner faster and they need to prosper. If you look at the audit reports, you find we saw that 18 of these municipalities were the, in the Western Cape. And looking at some of these municipalities, stability is very, very important. But you look at in other areas, and where's now with these coalitions now, which really destroyed some of the municipalities which were functioning very well. So stability is a very, very important element in the, especially as we go, try to turn around these municipalities. And we need to do certain things differently and professionalize the, the workforce in municipalities, which has been lacking and the process, the progress towards that has been very, very slow in terms of professionalizing the level of the workforce in the municipalities. Then looking at, I think the other part was about district development model. Is it really going to help turn around the situation? Well, the jury is still out on what it can do is a new thing, but looking at this, that particular model, there are some promising features of it on paper, because we know that coordination was a problem, planning was a big challenge. And I think there is a need for such a structure or such a function, I think, to be really lifted in municipalities so that coordination, planning systems operate. And yeah, so in PEP, on paper, the district development model is a promising model. And unfortunately, I cannot divulge some of the our criticisms. Now we have a paper now which is about to be released on the district development model. I don't have the authority to talk about it much, but I think what we are saying in that paper, I think it's a, on paper is a promising model, but the jury is still out on whether there's political will to implement what is contained in that, and also other forces which have really caused instability in the local government. If you look at, I said, the process of professionalizing the workforce in the local government has been very, very slow. If you look at, I sp spoke of competency levels, only 50% have 
have accomplished that. So the process has been very, very slow. But yeah, that's what I can say for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ngube. Uh, handing over to Tanya for a quick final comment. I'm going I'm to squeeze in a, a big one for you that you commented on. You know, I just want a brief elaboration from you. You said it's the vertical division that matters. You know, uh, Maybe can you just add a few sentences to that? You said we can tinker with the equitable share formula all we want, but it's the vertical division that matters. So I'm intrigued by that comment. If you wouldn't mind just elaborating on that and then your final comments and maybe your response to Hans before we close off. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, you're on mute. Un unmute. So I think that Hans was saying that all of this is motherhood and I think fine, obvious. Um, so why haven't we fixed it? Um, like everything in South Africa, the answer lies in political economy. Uh, so as long as we have cadre deployment, right, okay, um, where you appoint politically connected but unqualified people, this is going to persist. Right? There might have been a time in our young democracy where you could have argued that nobody has experience, uh, you need a diversified uh, uh, municipal staff, uh, but that isn't the case anymore. If you look at who graduates um, as, as CAs, for instance, uh, most of those graduates are, 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 are Black graduates, right? Uh, so there's a massive political economy problem, there's a massive regulation problem as well. Um, uh, so, for instance, if you look at your rural municipalities, they find it incredibly difficult to attract and retain uh, qualified people uh, because you can't offer the, the quality of life uh, that the cities actually offer. But it's exacerbated by the regulatory system because, you know, you can actually, in the past, you find that people would work in the metro at middle management level and then go on to be a CEO in a small rural municipality. Now, the way the regulatory system is, is structured, um, why you can actually earn more money with less responsibility by staying in the metro <laughs> rather than going to a, a, a rural area. So there are regulatory issues uh, that we also need to solve. And then there are genuine skills capacity constraints. Uh, you know, if you look at municipal manage, managers, I think it's a much harder job than being a DG. Okay, uh, national government, provincial government, you're spending other people's money, right? Um, at municip municipal level, you have to make your own money and you have to deal with communities, right? Um, and so I think that there needs to be um, more of a national and provincial uh, um, nurturing of the talent pool so that you have sufficient uh, um, uh, people uh, who can be uh, chosen there. Um, the issues of the district development model, um, you know, as Mukululi says, the devil is in the detail of implementation. Um, but my take on it is that it can improve planning. It can improve coordination. But I don't see it really improving actual implementation, right? Because those are different problems, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, when you look at first iterations of DDM, it was more about, you know, we need a one plan which is more coordinated and longer term than the IDP. And that made a lot of sense. But you know, in many ways, that was what the IDP was supposed to be, right? Um, if you look at more recent utterances, they're saying, well, we need to create a structural solution. By that, I mean, taking districts up, uh, functions up to district level. And really there, I would say it depends on the context, because if you look at Western Cape, for instance, the locals are stronger than the districts, uh, but elsewhere in the country, it might work. So. Um, you know, really, it's how you implement and also, uh, you know, can you follow an asymmetric approach? Because I don't think one uh, size is going to fit all. Uh, and then on the, um, the uh, vertical division versus the horizontal division. Okay, basically, the vertical division determines the total pool first that's going to local government. And then the formula split it up in various ways, right? Um, so you can tinker with that formula, which will influence the relative distribution. But unless you increase the total amount going to local um, government, you actually then just paying musical chairs with underfunding, if you know what I mean, right? Um, uh, and so for me, you know, the issue of your bailouts is critical because where do the bailouts come in? The bailouts come in from ESCOM, from 
it is so is. So they all come in in the in the in the national sphere, and you know one wouldn't mind bailouts <laughs> if the bailouts is linked to conditionalities and governance changes that will actually appreciably improve service delivery. But because of the political economy, it doesn't matter who the board is. The minister is always going to override because of political economy concerns. Great, thank you, thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Mkululi. I'm sure you would all agree that uh, these were fantastic, uh, very interesting and rich inputs, gave us a much better insight uh, into the impact of COVID-19 on district and local municipalities. Very detailed analysis. Uh, I found it very, very useful. And the debate is still going on in the chat box, which is fantastic. I'm sorry if we couldn't get to all the inputs and questions, um, but uh, I hope we have done justice to, to your engagement. We've gone a little bit over time, but I think um, I think we, we can certainly live with that because it was a fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, many thanks to Professor Ajam, Tanya, thanks so much. And uh, thanks Dr. Ngube, uh, fantastic uh, that you were here with us and uh, thanks for your presentations. Thanks to the audience for joining us. Thanks to Hans Seidel Foundations for sponsoring us. Um, and um, yeah, um, have a wonderful evening and um, um, we hope to see each other soon again. Keep an eye on uh, our communication for the next uh, webinar in, in the series um, and have a nice have a nice day further. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye, thanks.